I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. To me, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. A 
don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. I actually was uh, laying in bed one morning and I, I, I heard, I want you to start a camp for at-risk African-American young men. Uh, I mowed it over for a couple days. I talked to my wife about it. So he had his dream. He woke up, he said, babe, um, I, I feel like I should do something. And I'm like, okay. So he's telling me in my mind, I'm smiling on my face in my mind, I'm like, here we go. <laughs> I was thinking I needed a facility, you know, some place to, you know, house everyone. But, um, you know, God spoke to me and said, well, look at what I've already given you. What are you doing with that? And I, and I you know, took a, a, a walk outside and I just said, you know what? I'm not using it for anything. I already have what I need to get started. I was proud. 
I was, I was proud because again, it was one of those things that was like, you've done something right. You've done something right. One of the things that I always try to do when doing something is incorporate my family. And when I approached my son and my daughter about helping out, they were very enthusiastic about it. I was like, what the heck is he thinking? What? At the house? <laughs> It's like, this is not gonna work. It's gonna be all boys. So they were like, Dad, how can I help? I love to be a part of it. Oh my gosh. So I'm like, man, is it gonna be outside or inside? Because if it's inside, man, it's gonna be a, a total train wreck. A total train wreck. I was terrified. <laughs> but now I realize that it's bigger than me. It's always bigger than me. It always has been. It was a lesson well learned. <laughs> You know, I don't know who has more fun, us or the campers. I can remember uh, having the first feeling that something needed to happen. I ran across a young man, he was 10 years old, so he was dribbling basketball and I said, uh, young man, do you know what you wanna be? And he said, yeah. I said, well, tell me what you wanna be. So he said, well, I wanna play in the NBA. So I said, well, that's great. I, mean, I think that's awesome. Hey, shoot for the stars. I said, but just in case the sports thing don't work out, you know, is there anything else that, that you um, would like to be when you grow up? So he looked down for a minute and he looked up at me and he said, uh, I guess I could sell drugs. And at that point, I recognized that something like this was needed because outside of idolizing someone on TV, a lot of our young men don't really have a lot of options or a lot of people that they can look to to show them the right way to live. So that was kind of the first time where I said, you know, I don't know what, but I, I got to do something. No funding, no, yeah. no, uh, no equipment, no sponsors. We just, we just, just trying to do guys work. You know, they're afraid. They're afraid right now of their safety. They're afraid that there's something will happen to them just because of how they look. And in this day and age, it is such a travesty that we live in a time to where uh, someone is judged, you know, other than off the content of their character, to be honest with you. So we teach them how to re interact with officers, how to, how to, um, how to handle uh, conflicts that might alter their life. We constantly tell them it's, it's not your fault. It is built into the system for you to be seen as a threat and you're not. So we take the time, they're able to ask us questions, anything so they feel safe and comfortable with us. The lessons I think daily is just to be proud of who you are. You know, I myself, you know, I, I, me and my wife, we wanted to make sure that we lived in the community that we wanted to help. So, you know, we could have easily, you know, moved somewhere else or been somewhere else, but we felt like, you know, we, we wanted to stay here and kind of help, you know, because that's what it's going to take. You know, he lives by the mantra of faith over fear. And so, you know, we do it in fear. We do it in fear until that fear turns to faith. And then we just walk it out. I realized my gift, and my gift was helping those who needed help the most. So giving back to those who, who needed it more than I needed it. Without God, we wouldn't have that purpose. We wouldn't have anything to work towards, a goal, nothing. This is our purpose, to help one another. Just the, the blind willingness for my loved ones to support me and say, hey, I'll be here every day. I'll stop what I'm doing. I'll make a way. I'll change my schedule to support you. That's also a big thing, because when you take on something of this magnitude with this many kids, you know you can't do that by yourself. Oh, do you mind speaking about the limo? <laughs> the limo. <laughs> So yeah, my family is a bit extra. We take all the kids in the, the, the limos. It's just part of the experience. 
If you have been generous, you're part of that. Another investment into each other. Last week we looked at serve one another in love. Your service has resulted in many thanks to God. And I, we got a piece this week that was sent to us from the boys that uh, for me it made my week. Look at this. Isn't that fantastic? And uh, just music to my ears to hear that you and I are able to have that impact. Well, today we're in the series, One Light, which is um, reminding you and me that we're, I'm just one light, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And we're covering the one another passages of the New Testament. And today's is this interesting collision because it's, it's this unbelievable need in our culture right now for respect with the verse that we're going to study is one of the most misunderstood in the New Testament. And if you don't know anything about the Bible, you've heard that this is in there somewhere. And you may not like the Bible because this is in there somewhere because you've misunderstood what it means. Ephesians 5, 21, look at this on the screen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Those are fighting words. Especially because many people know these words precede the instruction to husbands and wives and to children to their parents and parents to their children. And so we don't want anyone telling us to submit because we see submitting as be a doormat to people. And I'm going to show you that's not what this means at all, at all. Matter of fact, the Message Bible translates that verse so well, out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Out of respect for Christ. That every person, as we'll see, is a creation, an image-bearing creation. And if you respect the artist, you would respect his or her artwork. And so if you respect a parent, you'll respect that parent's children. And so out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Now here's a picture of a cabin of an airplane, a commercial airplane on a commercial airline. We've had things like I'm about to describe happen. And the particular instance I'm going to describe is an example of how ugly it is when that which should be respected and revered and honored is not or those who should be respected revered and honored are not john ortberg tells of the time he was on a flight and he was sitting next to a pilot and asked the pilot what are some of your most memorable circumstances that took place on a flight and the pilot said oh that's easy he said one time i was piloting a flight from New York to Miami. And this very elderly couple came onto the plane and behind them was this very in a hurry, very impatient young yuppie. And evidently we would learn later that they had been ahead of him in the gate and he had to impatiently wait. Then on the tarmac and walking to board the plane, he had been behind them and and stifled in his uh, desire to quickly board the plane, even though the plane wasn't going to go anywhere until everyone was on board. As you know, when you're impatient, you think you're the most important agenda in the world, and his was, and this was building up. By the time the elderly gentleman was trying to lift their luggage into the compartment above their seat, this yuppie was becoming visibly upset, visibly upset. Everybody boards. Time comes for when the plane's mid-flight for the serving of food and to get some pills out of the luggage in the compartment, the elderly gentleman stands up and when he does open the compartment, part of his luggage comes down and lands on the head of the yuppie sitting in front of them. And this just sent him off. He turned around, he stood up, he said, what is wrong with you? Being around you too is like being around a couple of children. I hope when I'm your age, I'll have the sense not to inflict myself on other people. And it was embarrassing. And there was a gasp that went through the cabin of the plane. Well, 
Everybody sits down. The attendant comes by and says to the elderly couple, we are so sorry. We are so sorry. Our apologies. And uh, the elder gentleman goes on to explain to the attendant, well, we're, we're, we're celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this week, and we've saved up for years to take a trip to Miami so that I could honor the woman who has been the rock of our family and raised our children, et cetera, et cetera. And the attendant said, well, is there anything we can do? And he said, well, uh, if you could, I would love a bottle of wine and we'll open it and in front of everyone, I can toast my wife. And, he, and, she, and the attendant uh, brought it. She brought this bottle of wine. The gentleman opens the wine. He pours it into two wine glasses and he toasts his wife. But after he toasts his wife, he takes that wine glass to the, above the seat in front of him and just pours the whole contents of the wine on top of the yuppie's head. And the cabin broke out in applause. Broke out in applause. Why? It's because we, we know intrinsically there's something wrong about those who should be respected being disrespected. And we know in culture how much respect is lacking. And, and here's the interesting thing. I got like, good news and our bad news in, in this message today. Look at these words. What is lacking in many families is the same thing that is lacking in greater culture. And that is, out of reverence for Christ, treat one another with respect. Build dignity into every person with whom you cross paths. And we know this is, this is a, a huge issue because the home is the manufacturing and distribution center of respect in a culture. Respect starts in the home. It starts in the way husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and, mo and parents and children and children and parents treat one another. And real interesting thing about respect is, look at this, when it comes to respect, what goes around comes around. So we have to go back to the basics of what does it mean? Submit to one another does not mean be a doormat. Submit to one another means I build into you dignity. I choose to pour dignity into your sense of being. And so this, this starts with a couple of principles. I'm gonna give you three. Number one, remember that every person you come across is an image-bearing creation of our Heavenly Father. Every person. Even the most damaged, soul-dead criminal was at one time an, an artistic expression of the Creator made in the image of God. And so that's where it starts. Brene Brown has a saying, she says, if you can remember that every person is doing their best, It'll change the way you treat people. And what she meant by that was some people, their best is criminal activity. They need to be incarcerated for it. But if you can show people respect that every person is doing their best, then respect starts there. And really it goes even beyond that too. Every person is an image bearing creation of our heavenly father. Every single person. And every person has that imprint. So remember that, even your brother, even your sister, your family members are an image-bearing creation of our Heavenly Father. My dad taught me, he, I think I mentioned this a few months ago, it, how, how treat every normal person as if they're a celebrity and every celebrity as if they're a normal person. In other words, look at these words that Peter said in Acts 10, 24. He said once he found out that God doesn't favor Jews over Gentiles, he said, I realize that God is no respecter of persons, meaning he does not show favoritism to any person or culture. That God sees every person in what he told the prophet Samuel. God does not look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart, at the heart. And so how would you treat a celebrity? How would you, it says, out of reverence for Christ, how would you treat Christ? This is what's amazing about Jesus, how he treated everyone. To the town hussy, that's what she was in John 4, the woman at the well, he gave dignity and respect. To the leper, Mark chapter 1, we looked at this in the spring, Jesus touched the untouchable. That was dignity is what that was. And so how would you treat a celebrity? How would you treat someone you have an easy respect for? That's how you're to treat every person because they are an image-bearing creation of God. 
There's an old story about Harry Carey. Harry Carey was the longtime famous color man for the Chicago Cubs baseball team. And one time at four in the morning, Harry Carey went to his car and it wouldn't start and he got out of his car and he was approached by two thugs who, had a, who stuck a gun in front of him to hold him up. And Harry Carey noticed that the gun was shaking in the man's hand and Harry Carey said in his distinctive voice, hey, don't shoot, I'll give you everything that I have. And the man recognized his voice and he said, Harry Carey, is that you? I love you. And Harry Carey noticed his hand still shaking and he said, hey, don't shoot. I'll give you everything. And the man said, oh, no, I would never rob Harry Carey. But Harry, you got to be careful. This is a dangerous neighborhood. How would you treat a celebrity? This is the baseline for us and how to, out of reverence for Christ, treat each other with respect. This is what God does for each of us. We're not all that impressive in light of eternity, in light of our holy God, and yet he doesn't show respect to any particular person outwardly. Remember these words in James chapter 2, my brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Treat every person as an image-bearing creation. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. And if you show special attention to the poor man and say... Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So one of the things to, to really work at is to, is to give dignity to every person that you come across. Why? Because every person is made in the image of God. Now they may be damaged goods, but they are an, ex, an artistic expression of the creator. Now that leads to number two. Here's a real interesting challenge. Practice living every moment in God's presence. Practice living every moment in God's presence. This is why this is important. Is would you really talk that way to each other in your home if Jesus were right there with you? Would you really do that? Would you really say, well, you hog, you're going to take up the whole couch? Really? You always have to take the last cookie? Come here when I tell you to come here when I say it, when I want it, would we really talk to each other without respect if we knew what is true, that we are in the presence of God? This is where our religion doesn't do us any good because in religion we're taught kind of a temple theology. A temple theology is, well, you know, when you're in the church, don't lie. When you're around the preacher, don't cuss uh, because God might hear you then. Well, that's temple theology. Here's the bad news. God's presence is something you're in all the time, all the time. And one of the things about, about living a life that's out of the with Godness reality is we become practical atheists when we don't live that way. Why? Because there are things we would do that we just wouldn't do if in fact we knew that we're in the presence of God. We just wouldn't do. Look at these words from Psalm 139, verse 1. You have searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue. Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. In other words... Help me to practice your presence because especially when you combine that with an understanding that every person is image-bearing creation, respect will start flowing from you. And this is huge because I'll tell you this, friends, respect is more important than love. Do you know that? Now, in the grand scheme of things, the greatest of these is love. But respect is the soil from which authentic love grows. And God will help you with that as long as you acknowledge, hey, Lord, you are in this room with me right now. You are in this kitchen. You are in this family room. You are in this office right now. And this is one of your children. And I need to speak in a way that reflects that. Number three, commit to the art of spreading dignity. Look at that. Commit to the art of spreading dignity. What this means is this is that there are certain actions we take 
that express an artistic flair for building dignity into people a little bit at a time. Let me give you some examples. Look people in the eye and really listen with your whole being. Wherever your feet are, be all there. Look people in the eye, listen with your whole being. There's a real interesting verse of scripture in Psalm 17, verse 8, that says, Lord, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. That's from an old Hebrew idiom that if you look closely enough at a person, you can kind of see that little apple shape in their eye. And when you look that closely, you see your own reflection in a person's eye. And our eyes literally act as a mirror to other people. The power, the power of the eye is stunning. You can build dignity just with your eyes, just with your eyes. And as a matter of fact, today, we have this little distraction with our eyes. So it's easy to be in at home and we're not really listening with our whole being because one of these is in our hand. And what we're looking at is really our phone while we're saying we're listening, but we're not listening with our whole being. Listen with your eye. That if it's up to you, they're gonna see the apple in your eye. They're gonna see the reflection of their value in your attention. And I can say from experience, one of the worst things you can do in marriage is when your, your spouse is trying to express herself to you, do something else while she's doing that. Like be doing something that's sort of distracting you. Not a good thing because it says a disrespect. That's what it says. Along with that, smile. A smile. Sherry and I did so many things wrong as parents, not because we weren't trying, but I'll tell you one thing we did right and we still practice today. And we committed ourselves early on when we became parents. Whenever our children come into the room, into our presence, we smile. Because that smile would again reflect that mirror effect. You are worth respect. You are worth dignity. I love your being in my presence. It's amazing how a simple, genuine smile reflects dignity back to a person. And don't wait till your children earn this. You start the cycle of respect in your family by, by demonstrating through the power of a smile. Another one, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Because this says, when I speak truth, it says I respect you too much not to tell you the truth. But in love says my tone will be respectful. My tone will be respectful. Parents, this starts with you. If you want your family to have respect, you show respect with how you talk to your children from early as possible. Just because you're the parent and they are supposed to respect you doesn't let you off the hook to talk to them as a human being, as an image bearing creation who also age appropriate deserves respect. I can tell you when you start talking to your kids at an age appropriate level of respect, they will want to be around you more. The number one reason why kids don't want to be around their parents is they feel the lack of respect that they, they haven't earned yet. They haven't earned it, but it's not being given either. And usually it's our disposition, not our position that is offensive and demeaning. Speak the truth and love in your family. Start that early on. Number three, over deliver. Or number four, over deliver. This means that Jesus said, you, you have to go one mile, go two. Go two miles, be a two mile person. Why? Because when you give more than what was expected, when you anticipate needs, you're saying this person's worthy of being served. This person's worthy of my respect. Next, say thank you and mean it. Mean it, really mean it. When I'm grateful, if your spouse fixes dinner and you're really grateful, what that says is, is I respect your time. Uh, number one, number one under, un, underminer of marriage is expectations. If I expect my spouse to do certain things, when they do, I won't be grateful because why? It's expected. You don't send a thank you note every, every uh, or you don't receive a thank you note every month from your bank thanking you for paying your mortgage. It's an expectation. And so the reason why so many marriages go cold is because of the respect that comes with a genuine thank you for serving me. Thank you for serving our family is absent. Next, frequently say, I have a lot of respect for you and really mean it, really mean it. Because it is important to say, I love you. What is 
equally important, I believe, is to say, I have so much respect for the work you've put in. I have so much respect for your effort. And it's irrespective of the outcome. You're not saying I respect you because you're a champion, which is tied to performance, but I respect you just the person you are. It's important to say that to one another because I'm telling you, there is no genuine love that grows in your home without the soil of respect. And if you've blown it, then you need to apologize for it and start over practicing the art of giving dignity. One of my favorite biographies of all time was one that was written by Patricia Cornwell. Now, you know that name as the author of a very popular fictional series for many years, the Case Scarpetta series of forensic science. Patricia Cornwell was one of the most famous authors of the last 30 years in America. Well, she grew up in Montreat, North Carolina, near Billy and Ruth Graham. And Ruth Graham, at a very young age, built into Patsy Corndrell. She built into her. She befriended her. She uh, cast vision into her. And when, I highly recommend the book that Pat, Patricia Cornwell wrote about Ruth Bell Graham. And in that book, she says this, Ruth gave me my first leather-bound journal and told me I should be a writer when I was just a young girl down the road. When I used to walk to the tennis courts or post office, let's say, she would pass me going the other way and I'd wait and turn around. And later she'd reappear. And since we were both then heading in the same direction, she'd open the door, let me in. I always ended up right back where I started from, usually at my house. And I'd wait until she disappeared in a swirl of exhaust because she was always in a hurry and head out again to wherever I was supposed to be going. Sometimes I had to run the entire way because I was late. I did anything to be with Ruth for even a minute. She always admired my brother's hand-me-downs and how they looked on me. Now think about that. Think about that dignity. She asked me about my mother and what I was learning in school. When she wanted to read my poetry, I didn't believe it was true. But I found out that she wrote poems too and painted funny creatures on the shutters of log cabins and cupboards. Maybe that's where I got the idea to collect smooth rocks from the stream behind my house and turn them into silly painted birds that had dead wood and moss glued to them. I, gave, I would give those to her as gifts and I would give her my words as my gift to her as someone who respected my poetry. Look, listen, to this. I thought she was the loveliest, kindest person ever born. I still do. And, you know, for 60 years, she's been a friend of that family. For 60 years, Ruth and Billy have passed away. But she says, I still do. I thought there must be something special about me too because of the way Ruth treated me. Why else would she notice that I played baseball and tennis better than the boys or wrote poetry and songs and was lonely? I, I evaluate someone, she says, by how he or she treats children and those who are wounded and don't have much. I got that from Ruth. And I remember a brilliant fall day when I arrived for a visit and walked into her house calling out her name while she was pulling back their German shepherds that licked me and nudged my legs. And when this, one day I couldn't find Ruth anywhere and I carried my bags to the room upstairs where I always stay and she had left a note on my pillow distinctly pinned by that hand that, that almost curled backwards when it would write, Patsy, I'll be right back, it said. So consider it. I sat on a bed that was built not in this century. It was so high I had to have steps to climb up and get on it. And as I sat on that bed, I looked at that note for a long time as leaves blazed beyond the window beneath a perfect sky. I reread the words and stared, knowing that I would always keep that scrap of paper somewhere. I felt like crying, but I never told her. The power of showing respect to a little girl who hasn't earned respect but it's a gift of grace to give dignity to a human being. If you want it to be in your home, adults, it starts with you before everybody earns it. It starts with how you and your partner treat each other, how you speak. Do you speak to each other 
in a way that's reverent. This is a child of God. A mentor once told me that, that one day you'll have to tell your children this. You can talk to your mother that way, but no one talks to my wife that way. And I did. Why? Because there has to be this respect that starts with the, the adults in the home. It spreads to the children with our tone and with our words. And a little girl grew up to be an author and an amazing person by all accounts because of a woman named Ruth. That's the power of cultivating the dignity, the art of showing respect. Look at the questions today. This is so critical. I wish at, this, at the risk of sounding audacious, I wish everyone in our country could get this message but the questions this week, and I want you to use your pause button and, and, and if you're with other people, reflect on these. You're getting on an airplane. You've been waiting behind an elderly couple. How do you react? Respect starts in the home. How's your respect manufacturing and distribution center doing? If you're going to send out little respect agents into the world, is, is that what you're training because of how you treat one another? Be brutally honest. What person or group would you struggle to show genuine respect that dignifies? And how does that line up with the God who shows no favoritism? Who doesn't look at anyone by outward appearance, but looks at the heart? Number four, who is your little Patsy Cornwell? Who is your Ruth Graham? And number five, commit to the art of spreading dignity. Where are you as an artist of creating dignity in others. Maybe you're at the stick figure level, but you can work up to starting with crayons and you can go to paint by numbers. And someday maybe you'll be a Michelangelo of spreading dignity and respect in a world that needs it so much. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve 